The Mandalorian Season 3 was a disappointment, to say the least, and for many fans, it's the final straw. They've now given up hope that Star Wars can ever be good under Disney. Now, there are lots of reasons why this season was so weak, from how Baby Yoda was brought back when he should have been left with Luke, or you can point at how the main plot starts in the seventh episode of this eight-episode long season. You can even point at how the show squandered an incredibly cool cause for conflict where Mando has the Darksaber and Bo-Katan desperately wants it. Like, this was an excellent setup for there to be some real tension between the two of them. A setup that has no payoff at all when Din just gives the Darksaber to her without her so much as asking for it. If you ask me, while all of those are definitely pressing problems, none of them are quite as heinous as this season's worst point of failure. I'll break down what it is in a second, but, but normally, it's impossible to prove how well or poorly a show on Disney Plus does in terms of ratings, because Disney is very secretive about their numbers. But that's not the case with this one, because the YouTuber Overlord DVD is, is basically the WikiLeaks for this kind of stuff, and he released the ratings conveyed to him by Source Inside Disney, and it is pretty damning. Take all this as rumor with a grain of salt, but according to this source, from episode one to episode six, the Mandalorian dropped off over 93% in viewership. Now, I have no way of verifying if those data are correct, but assuming they are, that is not just a bad abandonment rate for a show, that's an apocalyptic abandonment rate. Like, I have never heard of a show having a drop-off as dire as this. So, here's why I think the show lost its audience. They forgot to get the audience to care. And I know that sounds so basic, and that's because it is, but when you tell a story, it's essential that you build up a level of investment the audience has in the character's mission, making us want them to succeed. Because when you charge right into the conflict without giving us any of that vital preamble, your story will not land. To prove that, Let's look at episode one, when Mando goes up to his clan, and they say to him, sorry, we can't let you back in until you've redeemed yourself, to which he replies, okay, and he spends the next two episodes trying to reach a sacred pool on his home planet to get back in his clan's good graces. Now, that's all well and good, but there's a key storytelling ingredient missing here. Why does Din want to rejoin his clan? Why? Like, seriously, why? It is never actually said. It is such a basic question. But we get no hints. There is no dialogue. We have nothing to go on here as an audience. Don't get me wrong, we can guess what the reason is. If I had to guess, it's probably how he feels a need to reconnect with his old friends, even though we've never seen him suffering from loneliness at any point on his adventures. And he also probably wants to raise Grogu in the Mandalorian way too, despite how he has never once voiced how he thinks the nomad lifestyle is no way to raise a child. But I'm going to overlook this point. Let's assume that the show did convey that one of those reasons is why Din wants to rejoin the clan. Even then, there is still a big problem here, because it is one thing to consciously know a character's motivation in a story. It is a wholly other thing to truly feel for that motivation, to root for them, to empathise. That's what really keeps the audience sticking around. And how do you build up an empathy such as that as a writer? Well, here's how you do it. If you want to go for the feeling the need to reconnect with his old clan angle, show Din feeling isolated and lonely at the start of episode one. Uh, perhaps he summons up a contrived reason to go see his old pal Carl Weathers, pretending he's there on some important business. But when his flimsy reason for coming to see him gets unearthed, Carl sees right through him, sees the real quite sad reason why he came, and we get some subtext rich dialogue where he tells Mando more or less that he needs to find some real friends. Everyone needs a home. Living in the way he does is no way to live. And of course Mando doesn't talk to Carl about this and he just bats this off because he he has a very hard time expressing his emotions in this way, but you show the audience just how much the loneliness is bothering him. Then, when he goes to rejoin his clan and they say, you've got to redeem yourself first, it works so much better because you've done the hard work required to build up a strong empathy with him. Like This is far from the only time in the season this exact 
mistake is made. Like, I'll break down more examples in a second, but like, what's so baffling here is how this is an amateur writing error that you seldom see in big productions. It's so amateur that where you will commonly see it is in manuscripts written by novices just coming to grips with the basics of the craft. I'm not saying anything about Favreau or the writers, like I'm just baffled frankly as to what to make of this, because I have no idea how The Mandalorian Season 3 fell for not just such a ruinous mistake, but also such an easy to avoid mistake. All you gotta do is add in a few scenes here and there and you completely solve this issue. Like the first four episodes are especially poor on this front, and this is a good part of the reason why the show has that shockingly high alleged abandonment rate of 93% of viewers quitting by the time episode 6 rolled around. Here is a particularly bad example. In episode 4, a Mandalorian kid gets taken by a dragon, and the entire episode is about them trying to save his life. Alright, cool, but we have no idea who he is. So why should we care? Does this kid have any hobbies, or responsibilities, or anything that might characterise him in any way? Nope. We don't even know what his name is for Christ's sake. It's as if the writers expect us to be engaged because a child is at risk, and that on its own is enough to keep us rooted to our seats. Simply. It's not. Like, cheat codes like this do not exist in storytelling. You can't put in no work, then rely solely on the sentiment of Won't somebody please think of the children? to get us to care about this nameless, backstoryless, personalityless, relationshipless character who has all of the intrigue to him of a sheet of cardboard. Although, scratch that actually, because it later turns out he does have a relationship. Deep into the climax of this episode, while they're assaulting the monster nest, this happens. Wait until we clear the area. He's my son. Finally. There is finally a basic sentiment around this character that might spur us into caring. We now know this guy is his father, but not only is the relationship between this dude and his son not fleshed out at all, and it's so to such an egregious degree, these two characters never share any dialogue with each other at any point in this entire bloody season. Couldn't they have also told us this earlier? It wouldn't have been hard to do that. The thing is, I know exactly what is going on here, like I've seen it happen hundreds of times in my own writing, as has every writer to have ever written, because this is such a common blunder. It's basically a failure of theory of mind. The writer knew this fact, that this kid is the son of that Mandalorian, and went along assuming that the audience inherently knew it too, forgetting that it needed to be exposited at a much earlier point to the audience. This right here is a classic draft one mistake, if you're a writer be careful because you will often make mistakes like this in your first draft. Draft. But that is what pees me so much about this season, because so much of it plays like it's a first draft of a script in desperate need of revision. And the worst part is fixing most of these revisions would have been extremely easy. To prove that point, let me do it now, it will take me all of 60 seconds. All you got to do is show this dude doing some fatherly bonding with his son at the start when everyone's doing all of their training, clearly expositing their relationship, demonstrating how much he loves the kid. Then also throw in a moment where Din and this dude are talking about raising kids and the struggles involved, getting them to bond with each other, and then the kid gets kidnapped, and we see the father being devastated and irate, abandoning common sense, going in alone to the monster nest because he's so desperate to save his son, and Mando and everyone else is scrambling to chase after him to back him up so he doesn't die alone. There you go, a very minor rewrite, yet now it's so much more engaging to watch. And while that wouldn't turn the episode into a Breaking Bad-esque, brilliantly written masterpiece, it would do wonders to increase viewer engagement. Then on top of this all, you've got to also consider how this Rescue the Kid plotline has no build up and is not connected to any other arcs going on, giving it the feel of a side quest, meaning the irrelevant feeling of this story arc is compounding with the sheer lack of care we have for this random kid, diminishing the audience's will to keep watching even further. 
But all right, that's enough whinging. Here is a great example of how to get the audience to care in fiction. Let's look at The Pursuit of Happiness. In that film, we follow Chris, a man failing to make ends meet. He's unemployed, he can't pay his rent, and worse, he has a son whom he loves dearly, and he's totally unable to provide for him. It's so bad, Chris has to sleep in a public bathroom with him because he has nowhere else to go. All the while, Chris is interning at a brokerage firm. Uh, he is not being paid for this, but he's doing it because there is the potential offer for a job at the end. However, he's competing against dozens of other interns for this job. I have never seen a film that is so unkind to its protagonist. Just when you think it couldn't get worse for Chris, it does. But you know what? When he turns out for that job interview and he's an absolute mess because of a spot of really rather bad luck, where he couldn't clean himself up before he came, the audience is on the edge of their seats and couldn't be more afraid for him. When he completes that Rubik's Cube, or when he completes that test, we get these rare victory moments where he proves just how great he is at what he does, and the audience feels so fantastic for him, we almost want to get up and cheer. In The Pursuit of Happiness, we couldn't want Chris to succeed more, because the film does an excellent job at not just making him a really likeable protagonist, but at showing you how desperate his situation is. And when, in the end, he actually lands the job against all odds, we couldn't be happier for him. That right there is how you handle this. It's not enough to know on a logical level the motivation of he has no money, he wants a job so he can get money. That's not enough, you've got to get the audience to emotionally connect with them too. But now we've looked at a great example, let's go on to look at an awful one. Uh, this problem with The Mandalorian Season 2 continues on with Bo-Katan and the Mandalorian group in general. So in this season, Bo-Katan wants to retake Mandalore, it's why she wants the Darksaber, so she can gather everyone together to go do it. Okay, cool. But why? Seriously, why? Like, how is it grounded for her emotionally? What is her reason for wanting to retake her home planet? It is a very basic question, and the show can't be asked to answer it. Exactly like the issue of Din wanting to rejoin his clan, we can guess, but we'd have to guess, because the show gives us almost nothing to go on. The same can honestly be said for Din himself and the other Mandalorians. Why do they want to retake Mandalore so badly? Like, sure, here you can point at external media, and I'm, I'm sure in a novel over here or in the Clone Wars over there, like this was explored a fair bit in all likelihood. But that is simply no excuse. Each story must stand on its own two legs. Otherwise, the people who didn't see the external media will have a very hard time understanding what's going on. Here's a suggestion. In episode one, does Bo-Katan see foundlings suffer from respiratory problems because they're living on inhospitable planets with low quality atmospheres? And we see Bo-Katan trying to console a kid who is horrendously sick as a consequence of breathing such low quality air for so long. And then we get a shot of her face, showing her hopeless frustration at the whole situation. Then her expression stiffens into resolve, and we see how much she yearns for this all to change. Does this season show Mandalorians being treated like second class citizens on other planets, because they're nomads with no nation to back them up? And Bo and all the others are tired of being treated like scum, hating how low their people have fallen. She wants to reclaim the old ways and turn the Mandalorians into a respected group once again. Maybe it's all about how she wants to reclaim the lost status and glory of her people. That could have also been a viable motivation. I am not saying the Mandalorians had no reason at all to reclaim their planet. We did have a few moments in the season like Din saying this. Perhaps it is time for us to live in the light once again, on a planet where we are welcome, so our culture may flourish. And that's not nothing, but one thing's for sure, the show dropped the ball here hard, because the reclaiming of Mandalore is the main throughline behind this entire season, so they should have given us a much, much deeper exploration of why the Mandalorians want to do that. A few throwaway lines here and there simply don't suffice. One thing that comes to mind here is that there's another sci-fi property that dealt with a very similar idea, a group of nomads trying to retake their home planet, and they pulled it off much 
much better. I am, of course, talking about the Quarians in Mass Effect. In those games, the Quarians were booted off their planet by an AI collective they created that got out of hand, and ever since then, they've been homeless, living as migrants going from one place to the other. We see them living in decrepit, run-down ships, so much so it's become a major part of their culture to go on a pilgrimage just to collect new parts to replace their ship's old crappy ones. We constantly see Quarians be victims of discrimination. They're many xenophobic people's favourite punching bags. They're forced to wear these exosuits because their immune systems are so weak after having lived in artificial environments on ships for so long, they'll get an infection and die if they don't wear them. The Mass Effect games do a fantastic job at depicting the plight of the Quarians, conveying the desperation of that people's situation. So in Game 3, when they try to retake their homeworld, the player is really rooting for them, because we totally understand just how much it means for the Quarian characters to be able to have their home back. The same cannot be said for The Mandalorian Season 3. This is how you do character motivations. You don't just say, he wants revenge, or he wants to find a job, or he wants to go explore the galaxy. Like, show John loving his dog to bits. Then when he is brutally killed, we can really get behind the revenge plot. Like, show Chris in the pursuit of happiness, loving his son but struggling to provide for him. Then when he's trying so hard to land a job, we couldn't care more because we know how much this all means to him. Or even show Luke looking out over the desert with a melancholy on his face as he yearns to leave the nest, to go out and see the galaxy, to become an adult. But he knows he can't because of his commitments to his aunt and uncle. You've got to show the character caring, otherwise the audience won't. You've really got to be careful as a writer because there are so many mistakes like this that you need to learn to avoid or you will lose your audience. If you're looking to hone your craft and write better characters, a few years ago I made a Skillshare course all about this topic on how to write great characters. I talk all about writing villains and how to design characters from the ground up so that the audience finds them compelling, and if you like you can watch it right now. All you've got to do is click my link in the description and be one of the first 1000 people to get a one month free trial using my link. There are only so many spots available. I couldn't recommend Skillshare enough to you. While it is today's sponsor, I've been using it on and off for the past five years now because there really are some great writing courses on there. It is a fantastic place to pick up new skills and hone your craft. Once you're done with my course, you can check out Storytelling 101 by Daniel Jose Older. He expands upon what we discussed in this video on how you can get your audience to really care about your characters. And it's a course that I found really quite interesting. Again, if you're interested, do click my link in the description and be one of the first 1,000 people to grab a one month free trial. Grab your slot before they go. Anyway, thanks for watching, keep writing, and I'll see you guys next time on The Closer Look.